have you guys heard of something called the hungry judge effect? Basically, there was a study, I think it was in the US a few years ago, saying that criminals who were up for parole were much more harshly judged just before lunch than they were after lunch or early in the morning. And since Oleg needs to catch his flight, he switched times with me, which means I'm now going to be harshly judged. So uh, please be kind to me, and we will get through this just fine. Okay, so a few years ago, I had just come out of this meeting where we were discussing road safety or something like that. And I caught up with our test architecture expert, Sabina, and started asking her questions about variant handling. Because I had just been informed that with a modern vehicle, with all the components, all the configuration, all the different regions and fuel sources that you need to support, you can probably come up with 4.2 billion different variants of the car that you could build. And there is no way we're going to verify all of those. It's just not possible. So I, I asked Sabina, like, who decides what variants we should combine and what variants we should test? And she looked at me and said, Eric, nobody knows how to build a car. And I thought, well, that can't be true. We build cars all the time. I can see them rolling out the factory down the street. So I just said, okay, probably she's exaggerating for effect and didn't think too much about it. But I came to a conclusion quite a long time later, a new understanding of, of this statement. And it's not, it's impossible to build a car. It's more like no single person knows everything that goes into a car, all the components, all the configuration, all the uh, yeah, hardware and stuff that goes into it. So it's impossible for any one person to keep track of everything. So a car gets built through collaboration, and collaboration requires communication. So my name is Erik Stanesson. I work for Duoil. I also work for Volvo Cars and Volvo Autonomous Systems. And I'm here today to talk about continuous integration, continuous delivery in autonomous drive and other complex projects, with a focus on events, because that's why we're here. So my day-to-day -day typically involves building uh, projects like this. So to the left, we have a uh, autonomous mining vehicle, it just runs around a mine, catching or bringing stuff from one place to another. And to the right, we have one of the uh, concept cars uh, for Volvo cars, fully autonomous. Uh, yeah, basically, it's like a meeting room on wheels. So. I'm not going to be talking much about cloud today. I'm not going to be talking much about containers, unless they're actually metal containers that you can drive around. Those I, I uh, enjoy. But it's, it's got to be perhaps slightly different. But what I'm going to claim is that we also do CICD, and we also want a seat at the table. So uh, I'm happy for any chance I get to, yeah, to talk about what we do. So uh, we're going to talk, as I said, a little bit about CICD for autonomous drive. We're going to talk about how we, and we, I mean, like the, the, this kind of industry, are transitioning to events. What you should know about our industry is we're typically five or ten years after everyone else because we, we have to move from these massive, like, three-year hardware projects into more and more software, and that, that doesn't come for free. And we're also going to look into a little bit into the future. But I want to start by looking into just what do we mean by a complex system? So a complex system, or a system can be complex for, for many reasons. It can either be that it has some like really advanced algorithms. Maybe, for instance, in the autonomous drive context, it's the algorithms that look at a road and try to figure out where are the road signs, what's, what's going on in the world around me. So those would be pretty complex algorithms. But there's another side to complexity when you have many parts, like many different computers. You have the, the tire pressure sensor, you have the braking sensor, you have steering, you have window or windshield wipers and all that stuff. All those typically have computers connected to them. 
So it's both complex in a lot of parts and complex in, in advanced algorithms. If we were to try to build a car, it, it really wouldn't be feasible to just take all the individual components, all the software, all the hardware, and just dump them into a car and test it. First, some components just will not work together the first time you try it. And the more components you have, the harder it will be to pinpoint where the actual problem is. And second, typically you can't do that that often. So you will end up testing too many changes in one go. So we need to break it down. We start by breaking it down into multiple domains. So these domains, typically not that related to the product. They're more related to the organization because you have on the order of, of many hundreds of teams and you can't just like, yeah, you can't uh, have them all on, on one layer, so to say, it gets too complex. So you break it down into mains, you break it down into function areas, you break it down into functions, and eventually you end up with an actual component somewhere. So, yeah, what we see in this picture, uh, longitudinal collision avoidance is a fancy word for don't run into the car in front of you. And yeah, you can see that it's, you group it then uh, with more and more components into these functions, function areas and domains. And the idea is that these groups, which we will call compositions, as you see, it's not just one component. There are some, some uh, ellipses over here stating that there are more components, but each composition should be meaningful to verify together. So if you have longitudinal collision avoidance and the other ones, like lateral collision avoidance, meaning don't veer into other vehicles, then maybe you can call that collision avoidance and you can test that together. And if you have collision avo avoidance together with some other things, you can call that active safety, which is everything that prevents you from crashing, and test that together, and so on and so forth, uh, until you get to the, the final vehicle. Unfortunately, the real world is never quite this clean. So you will have a lot of dependencies going all over the place as well. So yeah, so longitudinal collision avoidance relies on connected safety because you can, if, the, if your car is connected and the car in front of you connect, is connected and the car in front of you emergency brakes, then 5G will tell your car that the car in front of you has, has braked before your cameras can tell you that. So that is, is also an important part. And of course, connected safety then needs connected experience because that is where the actual 5G is. So yeah, it all gets a bit messy. So if we say then that, that we cannot just bring everything to top level and, and uh, test it there, then we need to, to integrate things. I know that several people in previous talks has talked about integration as a bad word, but in a car, it's really important. We don't actually expect uh, the people who own the car to someday randomly replace, replace the computer that controls the brakes and put in some other thing there. So we're not really looking for interoperability, we're looking for integration. So to recap, small groups of components, test it, verify it, make sure it works together, bring it into a larger group, et cetera, et cetera, until you get to the top level. That's how we want to do it. Next question would be, how often do we want to do it? Well, the previous answer was about two or three times per year, because that was, was how often we were able to, to bring components in and test them. But that's never going to hold if you want to well, if you want to have happy developers, for one, it's really annoying as a developer to have to wait six months for your uh, verification results. You will have forgotten what you're doing long before then. So we want to do it continuously, or at least as often as we can. So the shorter time a developer has to wait for the results of verifying their change, the more likely it is that they will remember what they're doing, as I said. And also, the fewer changes you are verifying together, the easier it will be to pinpoint what is actually causing the problem. 
So if we want to integrate things and we don't want to do it continuously, isn't that continuous integration? Well, in I would say yes. But it's a bit unfortunate that everyone in my part of the industry calls this continuous integration because it's not really the official definition of continuous integration. If you go to the CD Foundation in their frequently asked questions, they will define continuous integration as the practice of merging all developer working copies to a shared mainline several times per day. So this is like taking Git branches or Git commits and merging them to main. That is what continuous integration is in the official definition. What we could define for this talk as sort of our continuous integration would be frequently and iteratively integrate components together in increasingly complex compositions. Fancy way of saying don't put the car all together in one go, do it in smaller parts and gradually grow those compositions until you have the full vehicle. A picture I'm really not going to have, to have, uh, to have time to go into, but can be used to highlight one thing is this. So I would claim that the sort of base definition of CI or the CDF definition of CI lives up here. So this is again about merging things to, to repositories. And then the rest of CI uh, comes into play. So you're still integrating things in the lower or the purple part of the picture. You're just not integrating code. You're integrating software and hardware and built components. But with this understanding of sort of our continuous integration, we're ready to talk a little bit about events. But to set the story, let's talk a little bit about before events first. So before we started using events, in uh, Volvo cars, for instance, then releases, which is the, the thing that you actually want to put in the car, so releases of software components, hardware components, and configuration, they were sort of uploaded to some network drive or maybe a SharePoint or Artifactory if you're lucky. And then someone sent an email saying there is a new version of this component. Pipelines were typically built that each team had their own Jenkins instance. They mainly manually started their pipelines. It ran for some time, it produced a release, and then back to the step above, take that release, put it somewhere, and send an email. And when it came to understanding quality or understanding the verification results, it was typically just known by the team. So go and ask the team, and they will tell you what the quality of their component is. This got really painful, increasingly painful even. So with experience from uh, other uh, companies in the region, in Gothenburg where I, I live, uh, primarily actually from Ericsson where uh, Emil works and he will talk more about that later, we uh, decided to start using events. To be able to use events, we need some infrastructure first. So our infrastructure contained our, uh, or was based on a vocabulary. We chose a really simple one. It had two types of events, and it was mostly object-based. So we had events for saying, I have created a new object, and other events for saying, I am updating an object. An object could be things like releases and uh, yeah, verification results and those kind of things. So now that we have a shared vocabulary, the next we need is a transport. So we chose RabbitMQ for that, just to make sure that everyone could send events and everyone who wanted could listen uh, for events. And finally, and this is not strictly mandatory, but it was the approach that we went for, we built a triggering system and we did it ourselves. So the triggering system, you define a set of rules. It's actually very similar to what uh, Shruti showed before. You define a set of, of filters, you could say, for messages or events, saying that when an event arrives that matches my filter, then I want to take this action. And the action was typically start a Jenkins job somewhere on a server. And with this 
pretty simple starting point, we were actually able to take some pretty good steps from this picture before, where everything was slow and cumbersome and painful, to a much more event-driven setup. So I thought I would go through a few of the uh, different events that we sent, not to try to be comprehensive or anything, but just to, to point out some, um, yeah, some important events that we had. First was dealing with releases. So releases, and we're talking again about software releases, hardware releases, and configuration releases, they are what we actually want to push through our continuous integration. We want to bring them from the bottom level, where we have individual components, to the top level, where we have a full vehicle. So we defined a release event with a unique identifier, so we could always point to, to that release, a version, and the location of whatever files were connected to that release. A release uh, can both be a component, but it can also be a composition. If you remember this picture, then what we have in the bottom uh, layer would be components, so built binaries, and what we have above would be composition of several components. But we would send release events for all of this. And just with that first event, we could see like a shift in how, our, how people were talking. They were more like saying, uh, grab that release from the event bus, rather than talking about, oh, you need to go to this team and fetch that release, and you need to go to this team to fetch that release. Because we already had, like, or we had with us a uh, central channel for distributing releases. So, if releases are w these different boxes, then the thing that takes it from one box to another would be pipelines. So, the main thing we defined for pipelines was an activity event, where we had an activity name so that people observing this could see what, what activity we are we doing. Is it a build? Is it a verification of some sort? Are we creating compositions? Are we handling errors? What are we doing? Next, something called chain ID. So a chain ID is, you can see it like a context. Basically says that several activities that share the same chain ID, uh, they are related to the same pipeline or, or the same pipeline run. In Eiffel, which uh, Emil will talk about, they have a concept called links, which in retrospect if ha is how we should have done it, but that's not how we did it, and uh, I will talk about the consequences of that later. And finally, for activities, it's very interesting to understand the result. So you want to yeah, see if it passed or failed, basically. Next event, which is also important for moving things closer to the car, is verification results. The, yeah, basically, on an abstract level or high level, in every transition to a higher level, you do two things. First, you either build or compose a new release, and then you verify it. So verification results are actually, or you need to have sufficiently many good verification results to want to move to the next level. For a verification result, we uh, came up with a concept, or introduced a concept, I would say, called uh, confidence labels. Actually, when I say introduced, I should have said stolen, and stolen from Eiffel again, which, again, Emil will talk about after lunch. Uh, I really, really like confidence labels, and I will talk, I will spend a few minutes talking about them. I think it's a really powerful concept. But in the events that we send, we reference the release that the uh, verification result or confidence table applies to. We have the confidence label itself, and I will talk more about what that is, the result of the verification, and links to it, so that everyone receiving the event, if they are interested in why did something fail, they have a link to the yeah, reports or logs or whatever 
uh, for the verification so that everything becomes nicely uh, connected together. I uh, really need to talk a little bit, or I think define confidence labels a little bit. And the way I like to look at it is looking at it as a stamp. So you have this stamp, and it has a, a label on it or connected to it. It could be system safety, which means if we load this into a car, the car will not crash with the driver in it. Uh, but of course, you can have a lot of other labels as well for both uh, non-functional areas, specific functions, or uh, you know, anything that is interesting to communicate the result of. And the reason why it's called confidence label is it states how confident we are in the quality of whatever this label applies to. So it's not enough to just have the label, we also need to have a pass or fail connected to it. We are either positively confident in some area or we are negatively confident in some area. So if we have tested lateral collision avoidance, which again is not crashing into other cars when you're steering, then we either produce enough verification results to be confident that that works, or we uh, produce verification results to indicate that we are not confident. So with this label and our green ink and our red ink, we just run across the uh, composition structure and we start stamping everything that we've tested. And typically, if we put a green stamp on something, then we are ready for the next level. And if we get a green stamp there as well, then we move on to the next level. If it's a red stamp, typically that means it's the end in that branch of this composition. We don't want to build a higher level composition of something that we know doesn't pass system safety because if we get up to the car and we have compositions that don't have system safety, then the car might crash and that's not good. So think some of the benefits that we get from these confidence labels, and, and I would say, I mean, I've heard these referred to as, well, labels would be one, badges is another, perhaps more common when it comes to code, like it has past coverage and past unit tests and stuff like that. It's reasonably well the same concept. But what you get from it is, it, I would almost say it forces the teams to think about what is the confidence that we produce? What are we verifying? What is the quality that we are checking? And then put names on it. And these names become very powerful uh, for communication. Because if I were to look at your test results and just see, okay, you have uh, these five test activities that you have passed, I don't necessarily know what that means about the quality of the product. I don't know if it's ready for me to take to the next level. But with confidence level, you could, or confidence labels, you could say, yeah, it's passed a system safety test, it's passed the uh, collision avoidance tests, it's passed various other uh, quality areas. And it could, of course, be just, uh, or it could be both manual tests and uh, automated tests and reviews and whatever you have. All of it can contribute to these confidence labels. Second, it enables us to move from just saying this team has done all their verification, so now we can move it to the next team. If the team continuously sends out the confidence labels that they have reached, then I, as a, an observer, can just say, oh, now this release has passed or has the confidence labels that I need for my testing. And then I can pick it then. I still have to verify that it gets all the confidence label before I push it upwards. Uh, but at least I can, uh, can start doing some testing earlier, and earlier testing means earlier feedback, so that's good for everyone. Okay, so we introduced a release event, an activity event, and a confidence label event. So now we can talk a little bit about what we gained from, from doing that. So one is automation without centralization. And this is very much connected to uh, what several speakers have brought up before, is that with interoperability, we don't need to force everyone 
to use the same CI-CD tools. As long as they send the events that they are responsible for sending, then anyone else can, can pick up those events and use them in whatever uh, systems they uh, feel is most appropriate for them. And maybe a common use case where that comes up is, uh, like Oleg said, Jenkins is an automation server. So Jenkins would typically live on our side mainly in the higher layers, because then we are doing automation. In the lower layers, where we are doing builds and things, then it might be more stuff like Zool or, or GitLab or, or um, GoCD or those kind of tools, because they, they have more support for dealing with code. So not forcing everyone to use the same CI-CD tools, which has been very appreciated by the teams. A second thing we get is observability. So there is a, a concept that, again, has been stolen from Ericsson, I think. Uh, we call it uh, follow your commit or follow your change. With the fact that events are connected to each other in our uh, setup, it's connected to these chain IDs, we can have a scenario where an individual developer can follow from their initial change that they've done through all the verification and activities that has been done, through higher level compositions, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the uh, end vehicle, if that is of interest. And they can see, like, how far did my change make it? When did it stop? And if, if I go look at the results where it stopped, how does it seem like it's my fault? Or is it something else? So where before, again, a developer would have to go and contact the various teams to understand if their change made it through, they can now look at the visualization or observability portal and see what is going on. And this is something I'm really hoping that we will realize uh, with or uh, implement with CD events as well. It's really helpful, in my opinion. The third thing we get is, I call it collaboration without causation. It's related to automation again, but basically what I'm saying is a team doesn't tell the next team that now you should start. The team sends the events that they are responsible for, and the receiving team can say, okay, now we have something with the appropriate events, so now we can move ahead and uh, start our activities. So, and in fact, many of these teams don't really know each other or about each other that well. We have one example where we, we receive uh, a component from a, an external supplier in this case. We do some testing in Gothenburg in Sweden. Then we pass it off using events to a data cluster in Stockholm in Sweden where some more stuff gets run. Then it, another event gets routed to Shanghai where some even further uh, verification goes on. And then it goes back to Gothenburg again. And uh, yeah, it doesn't require people to really know about each other. What it requires is that teams are clear with what events they send. We chose a pretty naive approach, I will say again, when it comes to using events. So I think I would like to do a little bit of PR for CD events, or maybe explain why I'm really enthusiastic about this project. Because we, uh, yeah, we made some mistakes on the way. And uh, I think CD events is looking really good. One thing that people have mentioned already is with interoperability, we don't have to use that much glue code anymore or write that much glue code. We spend hundreds or thousands of hours just making sure that we could get our Jenkins jobs to send events, that we could uh, send the same events from Zool and, and from GoCD and that we had yeah, test results published the correct way, et cetera, et cetera. And with CD events and with the adaption that we're already starting to see, then it will be much more of a pick and match solution to this. Teams can select what they want, and what they want, the CD, CI-CD tools they want, will still produce the events that we are interested in looking at. Yes. And another really important aspect, as I see it, is instead of, of going all over the place, which we did, I mean, I think we're on the third major revision of our uh, uh, vocabulary, 
events vocabulary in, internally in Volvo cars. Based on what I'm seeing with the experience and the breadth of the community surrounding CD events, I th I'm very optimistic that we will not have any major revisions, or at least not very frequently. Because the way we are discussing things, really we, we cover sort of every, every aspect and every use case of every event. So I'm, I'm confident that it will come out very nicely and that people don't need to worry when adopting it that it will suddenly change very drastically. Okay, so I would like to leave you with some key takeaways from this session. Uh, one, we do use CICD outside of code and cloud. Of course, uh, code and cloud are the, uh, like the, uh, a lot, lot bigger players in this uh, than the industry is, but I think the industry is catching up and I, uh, I can see already that we benefit from a lot of the CICD work that has been done in, in more code-related and cloud-related areas. So it's really helpful for us. A second takeaway is, I mean, I showed you, hopefully, that the problem is quite complex and that what we're building is quite complex. It's also quite concrete. I mean, we have real struggles that are reasonably easy to identify, but a bit harder to solve. But also, they are shared. So I've been talking mainly about autonomous vehicles today. Uh, Emil will talk about more like the telecom industry, but I would say it's like 80 or 90% the same problems that you run into. The problems are related to the complexity of the problem, not related to a specific domain like uh, telecom or, or medtech or autonomous drive. It's the complexity and the size of the organization that makes it the problem. And my final takeaway would be that there are communities of which CD events is perhaps one of the most obvious ones working on a shared solution. As Oleg said, there are plenty of opportunities to join these communities if you want to work on them or support them. And uh, yeah, thus far I've seen a lot of, of welcoming, uh, a very welcoming attitude from these communities. So I would encourage anyone who's interested to at least drop by and say hello, either in this uh, CD events con or on Slack afterwards. With that, I would like to thank you all for uh, or letting me eat into your lunch a bit. And uh, yeah, I think we have a few minutes for questions, if, if anyone has uh, anything like that. But uh, I've been Erik Stannersson, and uh, thank you for, for giving me your attention.